John chapter 2, and I'm going to read verses 15 through 17 with you. And then we're going to go over into the book of Exodus chapter 23. So we'll get both of those, and we're going to read, read them and look into them. Start with verse 15 of 1 John chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now turn to the book of Exodus chapter 23. Exodus 23. I'm going to start reading with verse 25, I mean 26. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. And I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, the Hittite from before thee. Now notice verses 29 and 30. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I've called this teaching the beast of cosmos and I've tied these two scriptures together simply denoting, as Exodus says, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, and then the beasts of the field multiply against thee. But by little and little will God give you victory over every circumstance and situation. You don't go into instant growth and maturity and development. It's by little and little that God develops within you the ability to overcome and to conquer what we call the beasts. God call them that. Now the word cosmos is what we have the English or the King James word for the word world. Love not the world or the cosmos. And there are two Greek words for the word world, <coughs> cosmos and aeon. Aeon means the age, or Satan is called the god of this world, which is aeon, the god of this age. But right now in 1 John chapter 2, he says, do not love the world or the cosmos. Now I was asked to teach this, not this teaching, but I was asked to teach the youth for about five or six Saturday nights and as I said, not next Saturday night, but following that will continue. This is kind of introductory tonight. And I went to seek God and want to, to teach you, and simply because when I first met Jesus, I was 21. And the first thing I encountered was teachings, not on this, but everyone said, well, don't get involved in the world. And all of a sudden, that term became very vague to me. It ever happened to you like that? All of a sudden, well, don't get involved in the world. Okay, I sure won't. Had no idea what it meant except the world. I only knew that something that was bad was of the world and it wasn't defined, so I still couldn't put my finger on a lot and it seemed to me like things were very evasive I when it used the terminology of the world. So I got into a word study, I began to search the scriptures and I found out that the world has a two-folded understanding and the main three groups of the world is called the material universe. You'll find that in certain scriptures, Acts 17, 14, Matthew 13, 36, John 1, 10, Mark 16, 15, speaks about this whole universe. Then there are other scriptures that call it the inhabitants, and there are those scriptures, you need to write those down. But the one I want to talk about is the worldly affairs. And this cosmos denoting the whole circle of worldly affairs, appetites, desires, attractions, uh, delusions, deceptions, everything that appeals to one's carnal nature or desires. It's everything that's set out there to draw you away from God, and of course, Obviously, since it draws you away from God, is to be obstacles and hindrances to the cause of Christ. And there are things set out there in the world that are set there specifically to destroy your relationship to Jesus and to draw you away from both your relationship to God and to His Word. And I want to share with you some, break it down in some detail. The worldly affairs, love not the world, the cosmos. Now, I'm going to give you a definition of the world cosmos. It's this, an orderly arrangement or organization, well-planned system. Harmonious functioning, perfect order. It's also used in, in Peter that he says the ladies do not adorn themselves to a certain fashion, a certain way. Well, that word is cosmos, the word adorning. Don't adorn yourself to the fashion of this world. Don't look like the world. And the reason being, I want to make this very distinct and clear tonight before we go any further. The word world is not God. You understand that? God didn't create the order of things 
that you're seeing today. He created the world, but the order of it he did not create. He created the world, the universe, and the inhabitants. But as you see it right now, God has nothing to do with the cosmos. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of the cosmos. My kingdom is not of this world. And he said, I've come to introduce to you the kingdom of God that is at hand. Denoting, you need to make a distinction in your mind, that there are two kingdoms, two world orders. One's the kingdom of God, one's the kingdom of Satan. And when you and I were born again, we were born into a hostile environment. For Jesus himself proclaimed that he did not come here to bring peace, but what? The vision. What is he dividing? The righteous from the unrighteous, the light from the darkness. And he separated in Genesis 1 the light from the darkness, type in the shadow of Christ's coming. When he set up his kingdom, his order, it was not the cosmos, he began to separate the first day and the second day, the third day. He began to do the same thing that his father did in the natural. Paul said this in Corinthians, that which is natural, then afterward that which is spiritual. So the natural seven days, then Christ came and set up the spiritual seven days, which are the seven feasts. Now, I'm not going to get into all that with you. It's not important right now. But just to show you that Jesus Christ has his order that conflicts with this world system. And this world system has an appealing factor, as it says here, that it's just filled with worldly goods, endowments, gifts, riches, advantages, and pleasures, which, though hollow and fleeting, stir the desire of man and seduce us from God. The express purpose of them is to keep you from living the victorious walk with Jesus. I had a dream about eight months ago. I want to share it with you along this line. Now, this I spent a lot of years studying this and running it all out. And it'll help you if you do take notes because it'll save you a lot of years of having to repeat it. But let me share with you about what happened about six, eight, maybe eight or ten months ago. I had a dream. And in this dream, I saw that I was standing on the, the ocean, uh, kind of the shoreline there. And every, there was a whole bunch of people there. And I found myself with an overwhelming desire to, I was involved in a race. And I knew all the rest of them was, but they were not as fervent or desirous as I was to get the race started. And I, kept, I started asking people, isn't there, aren't we involved in a race? How come no one is interested? Oh, they'll get around to it. I said, well, I've got to get going. I feel like I'm involved in a race, and I've got to get going now. Remember what Paul says, that we are to run this race with patience, who dominated, or the ability to remain constant, remain constant during the running of the race, no vacillating, no wavering, no ups and downs with Jesus. Isaiah 40 says that John the Baptist prophesying that Jesus Christ is going to come and he's going to raise up all the valleys and lower all the mountains. In other words, he's going to bring a balance, uh, consistency, no ups and downs, no valleys and mountaintop experiences. It's time to walk in experience with Jesus, consistent day in and day out. Well, I found myself in need of a fervency to continue this or to start this race. So I took off and I started running and I dove. And I don't know how it happened, but in the vastness of the sea, it became a very narrow little creek or river kind of thing. And I saw everyone else start to take off then. Some stayed behind, some didn't care, some were still kind of apathy, but uh, others were not. Some were fervent, some weren't. And as I began, I felt such a desire and I kept saying to myself, I'm in the race, I must keep going, I must keep going. And then I got to this uh, concrete or block wall and when I swam right up to it, it I looked both sides and there's no way of getting around it and I thought what am I going to do I, I've got to keep going I can't stop I, I know I shouldn't get out and look around I've got to keep going well when I did strangely enough from nowhere came this elevator and the door opened up it was on the left over here and this guy two guys were in there he motioned me come on we'll show you where you're going I said do you know where I'm headed oh yes we'll show you we know where you're headed well, I got on this elevator, and they took me to this floor. And when I stepped, the doors opened, I stepped out. I stepped out into uh, a room. It was a beautiful apartment. And then it was arrayed with all kinds of, of uh, 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 alcoholic beverages and uh, things like that. And a whole bunch of women were there, and they were very loosely dressed. And they began to say to me, uh, before you continue to race, stay with us for a while. We've been sent to entertain you. And I said, uh, I'm not interested. I have to get back to this race. I'm in this race. And the whole dream was kind of ridiculous because that's all I said. And people were very offended by it. But I kept saying, I'm not interested. I've got to get back to this race somewhere. I've got to get back into the race. I don't have time. No, and they got very offended. Of course, it uh, threatened the women's ego. But I said, I'm still yet. I wasn't interested. So I turned around, walked back out. And when I did, the elevator was there. 
Well, they got me and took me somewhere else. And when I didn't know whether I was going up or down, and I have a feeling it was down. <laughs> but uh, when the door opened up, I stepped out. And when I did, I stepped out into this uh, carnival circus concept. I mean, everything was going on. All kinds of stuff was happening. And everybody was luring me and saying, here, try this and try this and try this. And men and women of God and ministers of God, and they were coming up and seducing me with their money and saying, here's how you get money and here's how you do that. And I started looking around and I started saying, God, what am I doing here? So I started asking everybody, I'm in this race, no one was interested. Can't you see what I'm doing? And they're throwing, trying to win cars, and they're trying to win color TVs, and they're involved in this one thing and that one thing. And I kept tapping them on the shoulder and says, can't you tell me where this water is or how to get around this block wall? I'm in this race, don't you see? And I've got to get going. And they kept saying, I don't have time for this. Can't you see what I, oh, I won one. You know, oh, I won this. Look what I just won. And they were so involved in this thing that I couldn't get anyone's attention. And I became, I grew more frustrated and more frustrated as this dream went on. And I looked around, I found I wasn't going to get any help, and I'm going to cut this short because there's a lot to this dream. It's all in color. And I really believe it's a dream from God because it ties in with this. And after I went back to the elevator, I told these guys, I don't want to go anywhere else. After it took me about two or three other places. I don't want to go anywhere else. You take me right where I left off, open the door, I'm going to start from there again. And when I did, I got right back in the water. Well, a lot of people were gaining on me by then. And I got up, I started swimming, and I thought about this uh, scripture that says we're to run the race with patience. And I knew what that word hupomene was. It means to remain constant. Don't go to the left or to the right. Don't vacillate or change. Don't double, be double-minded or waver. Continue on the direction you're headed. And I thought, but this brick wall. And I thought, oh, of course, faith removes the block walls. So I swam right up to it, and sure enough, there was no temptation taking you, but such as common to man, there was a way of escape. And I looked down there, and there must have been about a three or four inch gap underneath this uh, block wall where you could swim underneath it, and I didn't know it. I thought it went all the way down. And when I, right underneath it, about a foot on the other side, was a bunch of uh, real rough uh, rocks that you kind of like a little waterfall that went down, and then it was a beautiful, calm stream. And I knew that the going this way was the roughest way, but I knew that once I got through it, it was clear sailing. And that thing just came to me like that. And all of a sudden, when I, got, I went through it, and boy, it was rough. But I hit it, and all of a sudden, a peace and a joy came to me, and a serenity just engulfed me as I continued pressing toward this beautiful light. And then I awakened. And all of a sudden, I was affected by it. My spirit man was affected by it. And I went into prayer, and I said, God, what is this? And he said, it was the beast of cosmos called Vanity Fair. And I saw the world for the first time, even though by the teaching and the understanding of it, yet I saw how God really sees it. There are things placed out there to entice and to lure you, to draw you away, to get you so involved that you absolutely lose concept of the very purpose that you were born. Now, the reason I believe God allowed me to share this with you is simply because you are about to hit the world. Did you know that? Some of you may be offended at that because you say, well, when they told me that when I was a youth, I said, hey... I know what I'm doing. Well, I really didn't. I didn't know what I was doing until I met Jesus. And whether you, and of course you got the edge on me, you know Jesus at a young age. I didn't know him until I was 21. But I found out that this world system was not of God. He did not create it the way it is. He is not operating it the way it is. Satan is called the God of this age or the God of this world. And this whole system was initiated and created by Satan's own ignorant creativity. And he was going to start a world system. And I want to show you how this system operates so that you can find out that Jesus said, you are in the world, but not of it. In other words, we have to walk in the, in the cosmos, but I do not have to operate and function the way it operates. I'm not governed by its economy. I'm not governed by its, its politics. I'm not gov governed by its uh, education. I'm not governed by its sports. I'm not governed by its pleasures and entertainments. Those do not control me whatsoever because we've been delivered from this world, thank God. And we've been delivered from the power of this system of which we do not have to operate or bow our knee to the way this thing and this system operates. This system operates, when I use the word a harmonious or a well-planned system or a harmonious function, a perfect order, I'm talking about by demonic order. Satan has it down to a finite science to ensnare and to destroy the Christian's life and, of course, the world. They're, they're headed on a course. Now, this word... I mean, this world, I put down here, the world is under judgment, denoting it's on a suicidal trip. 
It's going down. It's, it's already judged and damned by Jesus Christ. He has nothing to do with it. And if you get involved in the system, you immediately are a partaker of its nature, which you are starting to head down. Now, I'll show you how this thing operates because God set before the world in the book of Genesis two trees. What were they? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And God did not initiate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He just revealed that it was there. He showed Adam and Eve that I am not the originator of that system, but I'm going to show you that you are not the first that sinned. Of course, at that time they had not sinned, but Satan was the first one. And when he sinned, he set up an opposite order or system. Totally opposite of light, opposite of love, opposite of God's life. It was a road to death, destruction, and hell rather than heaven. It went the opposite direction. And God told Adam and Eve, I'm going to set before you my way. I am the way, the truth, the life, the tree of life, Jesus. And I'm going to show you what is the alternative way or the other way to go. It's called the cosmos, the system of the world, who is obviously the, the, uh, the mind behind the system. I think we know who that is by now. But we'll get into some of these scriptures. But the mind behind that system of the cosmos was the devil himself. And you are, if you are a partaker of his fruit, in the day that you partake of, you shall... Surely what? Die. Now I'm going to show you where the world has blown it because right now when I went to college and I did, uh, I was, uh, after I met Jesus, of course I went to some college and in and out of school and, and trying to figure out what I wanted to do until I met the Lord. And when I met Jesus, I went to a Christian college, but I still went with the wrong motive. And I want, if you've never heard anything or listened to anything, you ought to listen to this because this will help you more than a lot of things you've ever heard. That... When you go to college or any place to find what you want to do, do not go with the word bios. And I'll show you what that is in a moment. Turn again now to 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to show you a mistake that is easily made by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at verse 15 again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Notice those two things. Do not love the system, nor the things of the system. Now let's look at the things for just a moment. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, here's the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and the word life is bios. Anybody ever study biology? What is biology? Study of living things. Exactly. All right, there are three Greek words for the word life in the King James. Zoe, suke, bios. Zoe is always, I've come at you, might have zoe, life, God's life. Suke is a Greek word which we understand that he that loves his life, suke, self-life. Suke is also translated soul. So anytime you find a King James word that uses the word soul, it's suke. The self-independent life. And man is a spirit. He has a soul. He lives in a body. And that spirit man will partake of the tree of life, but the suke, the self-life, partakes of what he wants, independent of God. And that's the man that pursues the bios, which is livelihood, or the study of his own life. I want what I want to be. Whatever I want to be is fine. I don't have to check in with God. It's my life. I can do with what I want to. You ever heard those statements? Hey, Mom, it's my life. I can do what I want to with it. It's called a death or a suicide trip. And you are speaking, you are uttering from your God the devil when you say that trash. It's not your life. Whose life are you? Your God's. It's going to be either your body or his body, your life or his life. Now, you've set, God has set before you the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the decision is going to be yours. You'll either accept God's way for your life or you'll choose your own. And when you choose your own, you automatically start dying. It's on a course downward. Judgment. All right. As a result, when I went to college, I said, this is what I'd like to be. And I'd like to do this. I'd like to do this. And I'd like to do that. I'll try this and this and this and this. And I never asked God what my bios was. God knows what you're called to be. You may be called to be a carpenter or, or a welder or a dentist or a doctor or a psychologist. You may be called to be some of those things. But it is not your choice to seek those things. It's yours to seek God and He'll tell you what He's called you to do. And then you pursue His life rather than your bios. It's called the pride of bios. Hey, I'm a doctor. You ever heard you know statements like that? I'm a lawyer. Doctors and lawyers... And I'm not condemning them. It's just that Jesus said, woe unto them anyway. And I found out why. There's a pride of livelihood. The guy comes in in his own Learjet. He gets off. He's got his cool shades. And he looks down at everybody else as he passes through with this young girl that's laying all over him. It's called the pride of bios. That guy doesn't know it, but he's on a world, a, a, a world 
of this cosmos system that's taken him down. He's on his way to defeat. He doesn't even know it. So what God is doing with us is giving us the revelation and the understanding that we do not seek those things that appeal to our eyes, to our flesh, or to the pride of life what we want to be. I stopped trying to be and found out through Christ I already was. You ever experienced that yet? You will, and you already in Christ, you just need to have your mind renewed to it. I stopped trying to be something when I met Jesus. I found out I already was in Christ a new creature. That was a good start. From then on, as I began to partake of the tree of, the, of life, I began to have God's will, way, and order unveiled unto me. And as it began to be unveiled to me, I just made decisions what was already decided for me. Because I found out that my body was not my own, but it's God's. So it is with you. The Word of God says your body is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. So I'm to offer my body a living sacrifice unto God. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? What does he want to do with that body once he gets it? All right, is it because he's an ego freak? Sadistic? Sadistic? <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> Not at all, but I used to think that. And i tell you why. I was caught up when I was in high school in sports. And I played all four sports, and all I wanted to do was, was, was letter in every one of them. Well, because of the zeal and, of course, the ability that God gave me at that time, which I didn't give him the praise for, that was you know, all the ego trip, and I got all my lettering that I wanted. But the only problem of it was, I found out a problem. On Friday nights when I did good, I got to stay in ovation. On the Friday nights that I didn't do so good, boo. And when I met Jesus, I had a problem with an unrenewed mind. And I come to a point with God one day, I fell on my knees across, well, a little altar. It was a weight, it was a weight bench, but I use it for my altar. And I fell across it and I said, God... I'm through working for you. All you want out of me is just something that, that you can get your reward out of. And all you want me to do is to work for you. And then when I do good, you're happy. When I don't do good, you're unhappy. And I said, you're too demanding. I can't do it. I didn't know that wasn't God. See, my mind wasn't straight yet. I was identifying my father to the world system. And when I minister well or do something and people get their needs met, you're happy. But if I bomb out, you'll get upset and want to throw me away. Well, for I went on a six-month, uh, uh, what would you call it, uh, quit. I quit with God. I just said, I, I'm going to still love you and follow you, but I'm not doing any other work for you. Because all you want to do is just, when I'm in a spotlight, you like it, but uh, when I'm not, you don't get the praise, and if you don't get the praise, you're unhappy. And I had this concept, and I quit, and after about four or five months, actually about three months went by, I started seeing God begin to love me anyway. And I got confused about that. I thought when I quit working, He'd just shine me on. But I began to find out the more I went in his presence anyway, the more he loved on me anyway, and his presence became more real and more real and more real and more real to where it didn't seem to bother him. And I began to find out that doesn't mean anything to God. That's not the way he's thinking. And all of a sudden the scripture came to me after about the fifth, night, uh, fifth month, and that was, the scripture says, if you love me, you'll obey me. The only reason we obey him is do you love me? And I began to find out I love him. And I found out he did not respond that way. And when I bombed out, it didn't faze him at all. If I did good, it didn't bother him at all. If I did bad, it didn't bother him, as long as I was serving him out of pure heart. As, as I was really trying to grow and mature and walk in the grace and the light that he gave me, he continued to love me. And I found out something else about God. Paul says, while we were yet in our sins, he died for us. When? When we were good? No. You see, for God so loved the world, this whole stinking system and the people that's in it, Actually, he didn't love the system. Let me take that back. He loved the people of the world, the inhabitants. And he loved them so much, he died for them and showed them his system so that we could deliver ourselves out of that system and get into a place where we begin to find out that this book is a, really, other than just the Bible, it's a principle or a revelation and a knowledge of a new order of system that you and I govern our lives by and it's called the tree of life. And I'm going to show you something for just a moment about the tree of life, the Zoe of God. You are going to encounter hundreds of decisions between now and the time you die. And I encourage you to learn how to do it now. We do not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. And I want you to notice what it says. Good and evil. Both of them reproduced what? The same results, which was? If you partake of that which is good, you die. If you partake of that which is evil, you die. Now, what is he trying to tell us there? 
He's saying this system, as much filth as Satan has, which is the bad, it'll destroy you too. But there are things that are good that'll kill you just as well. And you know what some of those things are? You might want to take a shot at some of them. Huh? Maybe going to the show, possibly. Depends on what show you go to. Uh, how about possibly... <laughs> How about possibly uh, just a good livelihood? Anything wrong with being a doctor? Yet all your life you can pursue that and never find God. You're so driven toward that thing, it becomes your God. It's good, but you die. Going to, Going to church is another good thing that will kill you. Did you know that? How many knows that? A church that goes through a program or a ritual has not the life of Christ. You're not born again, but you go there because you think you ought to pay your tithes. You go there to get the conviction off or the guilt off. You go there for any other reason than God, you've got a problem. If you don't go because you love Jesus and the body, you've got a problem. You're partaking of something that's just good. Well, I pray every night. I've done it this way for 50 years, and they've been wrong for 50 years. But they've been good at it. <laughs> But they still partook of that which is good, the knowledge. Now notice the word, the, the, thou shalt not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What man loves knowledge, the spirit or the soul? The love of knowledge comes from what area? The suke, the soul realm. Because the love of God comes from the spirit. He wants revelation of God. He doesn't need to know God. Because the word of God says, the natural man cannot know the things of the spirit, neither can he receive them. How does it come? Spiritual revelation. The Spirit of God reveals Jesus Christ to you and it has nothing to do with your mind, your senses, your intellect, or anything else. Your mind, your will, of your emotions. It has to do with the entrance of thy word gives light. My spirit is the candle of the Lord's. So God used the spirit of a man that loves the things of the spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So you have spiritual things that love spiritual things. You have fleshly things that love fleshly things. And Satan has set up this world system to entice the soulish realm and the body to get into things and void out the spirit. And what happens in colleges, most colleges, is that they're only oriented for the mind and the body. The soul and the body, that's all they're interested in. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, philosophy calls that dualism. Man is only dualistic. He is a soul and a body. They know nothing about the spirit of a man. I told a football coach one time, the only thing you're doing that is drastically wrong with your youth is you don't train them anything in the spirit. It's just strictly the mind and the body. Get the mind full of the knowledge of books and 80% of the things you learn in college you don't use anyway and then get your body all built up in sports and when you're through with it nobody knows you ever existed anyway. It's all temporal, earthly, sensual, devilish, passes away, has no value to it and yet we prize it so highly. And yet we avoid and negate or absolutely avoid the spirit man and give him no recognition, no development, no strength, no food and he's the only one that's going to live forever. We have a problem understanding quality. We need to renew our mind to the quality of what God's doing. All right, let's take a look for just a moment now. Uh, well, I won't go through all the scriptures. Like I said, I'll get them down for you and make it easier for you. They're here, but this world under judgment, denoting this, that the prince of this world comes, Jesus said, the prince of this cosmos. He's coming, he has nothing in me. And the whole world, in fact, I do want to give you one that I found very interesting uh, in the Amplified. And I believe it's in 1 John chapter 5 there. 1 John chapter 5. Look at that for just a moment. 1 John 5. I'm going to read verse 19 to you. I believe that's 5. Yes, 5.19. Let me read it to you in the King James. And we know that we are of God, and the whole cosmos world lieth in wickedness. Let me read it again. We know that we are of God. Thank you, brother and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now let me read this tree in the Amplified. It's very interesting. We know positively that we are of God, and the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. It makes it very clear that if I'm in this world, but not of it, and Satan is the mind behind the system, for me to understand how the system operates, I'm going to have to probe his mind through the Word. And only the Word of God can bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make manifest the counsels of the heart. It's the, the Word of God is the only thing that can divide the spirit and the soul and show me where Satan is operating and what area he does operate in. 
He does not operate in the spirit realm of my spirit. His battlefield is my mind and my body. Now, I've got that down. I understand that much. But how does he use my mind and my body to draw me away from God and cause all these things to be obstacles and hindrances to my spiritual walk and faith in Christ? What is he using? And then I began to search the scriptures to find out more about what Satan uses. And all you have to do is go back to the book of Genesis, chapters 2 and 3, and find out about this tree of the knowledge of good and evil and how it appealed to Eve, how it appealed to what first John said, and they're identical. What Eve saw, in fact, turn to it for just a moment. I've got another study on here called Eve Encounters the Cosmos. Genesis. I'm going to read, starting with chapter 3, verse 4. Well, verse 3, but... Well, let me go to verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, she should have said immediately, Yes, he has, now get out of here. You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. That's a question. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Direct contradiction to the word of God. For God doth know. Well, sure he knew that. Part truth. That in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now let me ask you something. Did not Jesus in the book of Psalms, or God in the book of Psalms, call us gods? His intention was to do exactly what Satan prophesied. To open our eyes to know good and evil, light and, I mean, life and death, so that we could be as he, which is a new creature in Christ. But the way they went about it was the opposite of the way God wanted us to go about it. But he wanted us to have the same thing that even Satan prophesied. I want you to be like me. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and we know everything reproduces after its own kind, which we're Christ-like. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Didn't they just start calling themselves Christians? They were first called that. I wonder why. It's easy to call yourself a Christian. It's different when they call you one. Then you've got an ace in the hole. You've got something showing forth rather than words. They called them Christians. They first were called Christians in Antioch. So he says here, that's true. God knows that when you partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which it was not the one he's supposed to partake of, but the same results would have happened without condemnation if they would partook of the tree of life. They would have partaken of the life of Christ or of God, and the light of God would have went on inside them, and they would have seen both sides of the system, the power of Satan and the power of God, and they would have known to avoid Satan all their life and continue with Christ or God. And they would have, they would have been like gods, like Christ, in his image after his likeness. Now notice verse 6. And when the woman saw the lust of the eyes, that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, again just reiterates it, a tree to be desired to make one wise the pride of life, the wisdom of this world. Now a man knows what, well, I'll finish it. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave to her husband also with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of both of them were open, but they were closed. Isn't that interesting? They were open, but they were blind. The moment they had their eyes open, they went blind. So he's literally saying to us that this world system has a desire or things that entice to draw you away and get you involved in something that is not God's. Now, remember this. When we're going to discuss this next time, the mind behind the system, we're going to take a close look at this mind. How this evil work of Satan operates, how he plans destruction and death and to destroy you and what he uses to do it. It's a sad thing that he'll use your own brother and sister against you. We've got to be so wise, we've got to be as wise as a serp serpent but as harmless as a dove. We've got to be wise in this world system to keep ourselves from the world so it does not become a part of our life. I want to cover one more area here, I think. Let's take the world under judgment for just a moment and discuss some scriptures. I gave you 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Now look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Now I want you to read, look at verse 4. You adulterers 
and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. You see that? Friendship to this cosmos, to this system, is an enemy of God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This world is under a judgment, and anybody that becomes a friend of this world and its system immediately becomes an enemy to God, and to be an enemy of God is instant destruction. How many of you know that if you're not on the Lord's side, it's doomsday for you? I found that out too. Because if, not that God is judging us, but Jesus says, you've judged yourself. Because he brought the light, and the light showed forth, and if you don't choose the light, you just judge yourself. He doesn't have to judge you. The same word that you speak will judge you, he says. By thine own words thou art condemned, by thine own words thou art justified. Well, I'm going to justify myself by saying I've accepted Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I'm not going to condemn myself. I don't say that I'm of this world. Because when I do, I condemn myself with the world. I'm immediately back underneath its judgment. But if I say, thank God I've been delivered from the power of Satan, from the darkness of this world, and from this world, I've been elevated or exalted to a higher position of authority and a place in Christ Jesus at Father's right hand, then I realize I have passed from judgment under God's grace and justice. I've been exempt from the judgment of this world. Therefore, I stand in a place and a position that judgment isn't coming on me. And I thank God for this because if you learn this, you'll understand that the Word of God says God serves, saves His judgment for the wicked. And that gave me a good understanding of, each, of the, one of the six basic principles of the doctrine of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 6. It's called eternal judgment. I found out that I have, been, I have passed the judgment of Christ simply because I've accepted His justification. He became judged for me. He was condemned that I might be justified. As a result, if you are expecting judgment or wrath to come on you as a Christian, you need your mind renewed. It's not true. And that gives me clearer understanding that it does not matter to me if I go through the tribulation or not. It's not going to be passing on me anyway. I won't even probably know what's going on because I'm in a place under the shadow of the Almighty and I'm not even knowing what's happening. I'm having a ball. I'm getting together with Christians and we're worshiping and praising when the rocks, they're praying for the rocks to fall on them. We're praying that the rock of Gibraltar, or Jesus Christ, not Gibraltar, but the, the rock of Jesus fall on us. And we're enjoying the rock of, of our salvation while they're fearing the wrath and the judgment's coming on them. You don't have to identify with the world, folks. The world is under judgment, not the, the kingdom of God. If you're born of the kingdom of God, you're exempt. Isn't that good news? And the Word of God says that Jesus Christ has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation telling us to go and say they're justified and not imputing their trespasses unto them. Well, where did their trespasses go? Went to Jesus, didn't he? He bore so as a result, we're saying to the body of Christ, hey, you're free. Relax and enjoy Christianity in your life. You've got a good life, a good daddy. He's taking care of you, but woe unto you. Jeremiah says, say unto the righteous, it shall be well with him, but woe unto the wicked, for they shall eat the wage of their doing. And then he said this, say, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the mouth of the Lord, or by the sword of the Spirit. It actually is what it says. It says, by the sword of the Lord. So, if you are willing and obedient, glory to God, enjoy the fruit of the land. But if you rebel, judgment. You know it's coming, so get ready for it. So I encourage you to realize you are not of this world. You don't have to concern yourself with the judgment of this world. But there are two judgments in the end times called the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Does anyone know about those two or heard about them? Okay, one or a few of you have. At the great white throne judgment, who will be there? the sinner, the ungodly, the unrighteous. And they're going to get judged. Take a bow if you like. <laughs> and at the judgment seat of Christ, who will be there? We will. And you know what the Word says will happen? To receive rewards done in the flesh. Did you know when you stand before Him, He's not going to pass judgment on you about the evil deeds? Paul said this, they'll just burn up but you'll, and you'll, they'll suffer the loss of the reward, but you'll be saved. I mean, there's no judgment. It's just going to burn all that trash away that you did in the flesh, but you're still going to remain in His presence. And when people start prophesying judgment and damnation and condemnation to the body, just turn off. It's not for the body. It's not for those that have been justified. It's for the ungodly. Now, if you're the ungodly, you better listen and repent. <laughs> if you're not, and they're passing it on, and in fact, you know the Scripture says, well, judgment must begin at the house of God. It is, and it has. How's judgment come? 
by the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction and reproof for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. So it's the Word that brings correction or brings judgment to your deeds so you can get again back in a right standing with God so you can have fellowship. It's not to destroy you. Judgment wasn't intended to destroy. It's to correct and bring you back to a right fellowship. Man, these prophets are doomed today with, with the body of Christ. It's just not in line with Scripture. So you protect yourself and beware of who you identify to, either Christ or the world. If you're of the world and the cosmos, you're with Satan, who is the God of this world, and of course, judgment's coming on you. If you are of Christ, born of the Spirit, you're not of the cosmos, but you're born of the kingdom of God. You have been justified, sanctified, separated, and anointed by God, excuse me, and placed in right standing with Him so that you can enjoy the blessings. Isn't that good news? Amen. That'll help you all your life because I encountered a lot of the prophets of doom that's trying to bring judgment on me all their life and I kept finding Romans says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Well, I have no intentions of walking after the flesh. I'm walking after the Spirit. I'm not going to walk after the world system its order and I keep my body under control so that it does not go after those things that draw me away from God. The predominating factor is the strength of your spirits. And if you keep your spirit strong in word, in prayer, and in fellowship, you'll find out that your soul submits to it and your body's under control. And when Satan comes with those lures and enticements, your body and your soul may want to go for it, but you hammer it down by the spirit. Say, I refuse to let you go. You're not going that way. You're God's. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, I thank you for your word tonight. And I thank you that your word right now has healed somebody of a right elbow. There's a burning sensation in a right elbow. It's a healing power of Jesus to heal that elbow right now. I thank you, God, that pain's gone in the name of Jesus. Thank you for all that tingling sensation may be new to you and that warmth, but that's the healing power of Jesus already healing that.